Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, you are a God of great mercy, and we need you to be merciful to us now as we open up your word. We ask that you would help us to understand what it is that you're saying. I ask that you would make it clear and give me help as I try to explain it and apply it. Recognize that we come in with many different things on our minds. Lord, some are facing difficulties in their lives, immense difficulties, and are hurting. And it's true that any one of us can become distracted by other things. And so, God, we ask that you would help us tune into your word now. We ask that you would convict our hearts where there is sin. We confess that we are frail creatures, and we're not even always aware of all the ways that we're, want, we're wandering. So be kind to us and help us to see See that, to see where it is needed that we confess sin. And we ask that you would give us grace to turn and walk in righteousness. Oh God, we confess that we are so prone when convicted of sin to ignore your spirit or to explain things away. Please don't let us press upon our consciences till we turn to Christ in confession and repentance. We also ask, Lord, that you would lift up and encourage hearts this morning that are weak and wounded. Remind those who are downcast that you are near to them, that you love them, and that you delight to give them help. Draw them near that they would seek it. And help us all to walk in faithfulness to you. We don't want to just come and sit under sermons and building blocks and have our minds filled with knowledge. We want to be a congregation that lives according to your word, that longs to have our minds and our hearts and our actions conformed into the likeness of Christ so that we hold you out to the world that you've placed us in, the people that you've put us around as worthy of worship. So work in us that we may do just that. We ask that all of this would be for your glory. Amen. You feel it again. The temptation to give yourself to sin. You feel its draw. You hear its whispers in your ear. Come, indulge yourself. Find relief, find pleasure, find justice. We've all heard these promises before, and we know that they're lies. And yet, every time, it seems like they may be good this time. Maybe they'll make good on their promises. You know, somewhere in, in the depth of of our hearts, we feel like, all right, may deliver this time. It's a feeling that we're all familiar with every day, countless times in a day. Temptations come knocking on the door of your heart, and we feel the pull towards them. What do you do? What do you do in that moment? Do you tense up because you know how many times 
you failed before. You have anxiety just overwhelm you. Because in the back of your mind, excuse me, you just know <coughs> you shouldn't eat peanuts before you preach. You know that you're going, you just know it, you're going to cave again. Maybe you wilt like a blade of grass under the burning sun in summer's heat. There's no use in resisting. I've fallen so many times before. I'm done for. Or do you scoff at the temptation? I've got this. I've dealt with this before. <laughs> I know this one. And so you start, pull out the drawer, and you just start looking through all the strategies that you've employed in the past to decide what's going to work this time. How can I conquer this, this go-round? Well, the text that we have before us is for that moment. The moment when you're bombarded by temptation, when it seemingly is coming at you from every side, and you feel just how frail you are. This text tells us it's not hopeless. You should be encouraged. And yet this text is also going to warn us. Sin is sneaky. It can distract us. It can get us fixated over here on one particular problem all the while taking us down from behind through our own self-confidence. Now, this text tells us, don't put confidence in the flesh. The persistent drumbeat throughout Hebrews has been, hold fast to Jesus. You know, the author told us in 2 verse 1 that we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, referring to the supremacy of Jesus and the glory of his atoning work. He said in 3 verse 1 to consider Jesus, and then in verse 6 that we are part of God's family if we hold fast to our confidence and boasting in our hope, which is Christ. And then we saw last week in 4.14 that we are to hold fast to our confession of Jesus. And we've seen specifically throughout Hebrews 4 that we are to hold fast to Jesus so that we enter into God's promised eternal rest. The author is exhorting his audience and therefore also us not to fall into disobedience like Israel did out in the wilderness. They fell and so they did not enter into the rest that God was holding out for them, offering to them. And the warning for us is that we too will come up short of that rest if we do not persist in faith. And so he tells us in 4 verse 11, let us strive to enter that rest. Our entrance into this rest, as we saw last week, is made possible through Jesus, who is our great high priest. He is the one who has passed through the heavens into the heavenly throne room, having made the sacrifice to secure God's rest for his people. You remember that the high priest was one who was responsible in Israel for the sacrifices that would pause God's wrath year after year against his covenant people. Those high priests would go into the Holy of Holies with the blood of bulls and goats, first in the tabernacle, and later in the temple. Well, Jesus, as the great high priest, our better high priest, is the one who has made the final sacrifice, offering up himself to secure atonement for his people. It is his own blood that he carries into the heavenly throne room that turns away the wrath of God and the judgment of God once and for all. And so his role as our high priest should give us an abundance of confidence because, first, of the finality of 
his priestly work, but also because of how closely it is that he relates to us, the people that he died to save. So let's read again verses 15 and 16, and then let's consider them together. Verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the first teaching point that's going to come with a couple of sub-points is that Christ is our righteousness. So verse 14 emphasizes the up thereness of Jesus. It's talking about his transcendence. Now, when we talk about the transcendence of God, you need to understand that we're not just talking exclusively in like spatial terms. It's not just about location. It does emphasize that God is on high, but there's so much more to it than just that. It's emphasizing that, that God is distinct from us, his creatures. We are made by him and are dependent on him for our being. We live and move because he maintains us. He's not like that. He's not dependent on his creatures for his being. He is not dependent upon anything for his existence. No, he is self-contained. All that is necessary for his being is contained within himself. And the self-contained God, who does not depend on his creation for his being, is enthroned in the heavens. He is ruling over the creation he has made, bringing about all of his purposes. He is transcendent. Christ, as we saw, is the Son of God. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He is true God of true God, of one essence with the Father. And so the Son is transcendent. And the transcendent Son of God, the eternal Son of God, has made the once and for all sacrifice for us, the sheep of his flock. As our high priest, he has gone into the heavenly throne room where he is seated on high. And so it could be tempting for us to look at verse 14 or maybe jump all the way back to Hebrews 1, 3, and 4 and think, okay, that's wonderful. Like, that's great. And it is. Like, praise the Lord. This is the God who knows us, right? But it might be tempting to go, well, if that's who he is, how on earth? earth is it that that he can understand my struggle with sin Uh, look how great our god is he sits enthroned in the heavens he is upholding the universe with the word of his power he's so much greater than me he's incredibly magnificent how can one so pure so holy so righteous so good so powerful understand my daily grind against the temptations that assail me all day, every day. Well, verse 15 tells you that he does understand you. The author says emphatically that in Christ Jesus, the Son of God, you have a high priest who is able to sympathize with you in your weaknesses. And he does this through the double negative. Look at what he does. He is hammering this home. You do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with your weaknesses. He's not just up there, away from you, aloof to your struggles. No, he is drawn near to you, very near to you. I I want you, for just a moment, to let those words just bounce around in your ears, turn them over in your mind. Jesus 
your great high priest sympathizes with you in your weakness. It's it's astounding. And it's glorious. So a few sub-points to consider here. And and the reason for this is the the point that's being made in verse 15 is so wonderful. And so the hope is that these help us start to wrap our minds around what this text is saying to us and how it points us to Christ as our righteousness. We need God grant, to grant us the grace that we would see it, and may he do so. So, for a sub-point, we are vulnerable to temptation because our flesh is weak. You know, the author makes reference to our weaknesses there in verse 15. And we know that we, we come into the world sinful because of our relationship to Adam. He was our representative before God there in the Garden of Eden. But we also need to recognize that Adam was acting on our behalf in a priestly role. He dwelt in the Garden, the place where God's presence was uniquely present in the world that he made, just like it would be uniquely present on Mount Sinai and in the tabernacle and then in the temple. Adam was tasked with working and keeping the garden, just like the priests would later be tasked with working and keeping the temple, maintaining the holy place, maintaining the place where God's presence was uniquely present among his people. He was meant to keep it clean, to keep it pure, as the priests were meant to keep the worship of God in Israel pure. And, of course, he was to worship there in the garden, in the presence of God. And he was to lead his wife to do the same, and to lead all his offspring to do the same, as they filled the creation and pushed the boundaries of Eden around the globe. So as our priest, our representative priest, he could have purified his offspring by accepting the one restriction that God gave to him. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But rather than purify through obedience, he corrupted his offspring through disobedience. You know, Paul lays this out in Romans 5. I want you to consider verses 12 through 14. Paul writes, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. One just brief aside here, we may hear or maybe even be tempted ourselves to think, you know, Adam, not a real person, like representative um, um, in the sense of a metaphor, an image of, to explain what happened in the beginning, to explain why the world is the way that he is. But but the Bible's not actually talking about a real flesh and blood person. Well, yes, it is. And Paul's doubling down on that. This was a real man living in a real place really in the presence of God, really representing us before him, and he failed. Sin came into the world through Adam, and then death spread, which Paul is showing serves as evidence of man's complete corruption. That's what he does in verses 13 and 14. See, he says that those who lived between Adam and Moses, they all died. But what makes them different between Adam and, the, uh, and uh, those uh, under Moses is they didn't have a law to break. Adam had a law to break. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge, good and evil. Through Moses, we know, came the law. And yet, people kept dying. You might have heard Genesis 5 referred to as the graveyard of the Bible. So-and-so was born, and they lived this many years, 
and they had sons and daughters, and then they died. And then they died. And then they died, and then they died, and then they died. Why? Why is that? Because our very nature was corrupted. Our very nature was made sinful. When Adam fell, we all fell with him. Which is why Paul can go on and say in verse 19, For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. You know, Paul goes on to describe mankind outside of the redemptive work of Christ as enslaved to sin in Romans 6.6, 6, as dead in our trespasses and sins in Ephesians 2.1, and on that basis, he can say in Romans 8.8 8, that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, we have to recognize that being tempted to sin and committing sins are not the same. Temptations to sin do not make you unrighteous or make you guilty before God. Adam was not guilty because he was tempted by the serpent to take of the tree and eat. He was guilty and plunged his whole creation, his whole offspring, his whole line, all of humanity, into guilt and corruption because he didn't trust God. And he broke the commandment. And he took. And he ate. The temptation and committing sins are not the same thing. But, because we are full of weaknesses through Adam's fall, we do fall when tempted. And this remains an issue even for those who have been redeemed by Christ. Though we're no longer slaves to sin, our flesh is still weak. Despite the fact that the prison cell has been thrown open, that the shackles have been taken off of our ankles and wrists, we still walk right back through the open door and reattach our chains. Paul shows this in Romans 7, 18 and 19. He says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. A couple of verses later, 22 and 23, he says, For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Paul is writing about his experience as a Christian. He says that he delights in the law of God. He desires to do good. He does not desire to do evil. These are Christian desires. These are godly desires. And yet, he identifies an inner battle. He has the desire to do what is right. He has delight in the law of God. But he does not have the ability to carry it out because man's corruption still plagued him. Like the pounding of water on a rock. Even the defenses of the redeemed erode and crumble because there remains a weakness in our flesh. So what is God's response to all this? I mean, surely in pity, He looks down on us and He says, Oh, poor, poor helpless people. Let me lower the bar. Let me bring it low so that they're able to step over it themselves so that they can do enough. No. No, he does not. God doesn't adjust his righteous requirement in order to accommodate our weaknesses. God requires perfection. He told Israel under the Old Covenant in Leviticus 19.2, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. He doubles down on this in the New Covenant. Jesus saying in Matthew 5, 48, You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the standard 
in order to have our sins forgiven. That's the level to which you and I must attain in order to make peace with God all on our own. And we may have a desire within us, oh man, I wish he would relax that standard, because this is hard. I, 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 I want to, but I can't. And I think that's because we like to be in control. We like to be able to say, yeah, I did it. Look at me. Look at what all I have accomplished by the might of my hands. But to want that is to want something that is lesser. God the Son took on human flesh and He met the standard of righteousness for us. We have a great high priest who both understands our weakness and has achieved our redemption through His own perfection. It's the second sub-point. Jesus took on flesh to accomplish what we never could. The author of Hebrews says that Jesus can sympathize with us in our weaknesses and that He has been tempted in every respect as we are. This points us to the incarnation. Just use a word like that. Recognize there may be some of you who are new to Christianity. And even if that's not the case, we'll recognize We've got lots of little boys and little girls in the room. And that's awesome. Like, parents, keep on. I know it's hard. They're wiggly. They're loud. Who cares? Keep on raising your children to know and worship the Lord. But recognizing that there are little boys and little girls in the room, and we're talking about a big word like incarnation, little boys, little girls, tune in, listen. This is a fun word to learn what it means. It's big and it seems hard to understand. But all that we mean when we start talking about the incarnation is that God became a man. Specifically, God the Son took on human flesh, which is a doctrine that is all over the New Testament. A couple of examples. John 1.1 1, 1, and then verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Philippians 2, 5-8. through eight. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though He was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now what we see clearly taught first is that Jesus is and always has been fully God. But in the incarnation, the eternal Word, who is God, took on flesh. He didn't become like a man. He didn't appear as if he was a man, he became fully man. The one equal with God humbled himself by taking on the likeness of man. And just a brief note on Philippians 2. You know, Paul says that Jesus uh, emptied himself, but he doesn't mean that he emptied himself of his, his divinity. He was not exclusively a man, missing his divine nature, during his earthly ministry, he was fully both. Fully God, fully man, in the one man, Jesus. And the author of Hebrews has already pointed to the necessity of the incarnation as it relates to Jesus' priesthood. Earlier in Hebrews, in Hebrews 2, 14 through 17, he says in 14 and 17, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of, of the people. Look again at 17. 
He had to be made like his brothers in every respect. That is, he had to share in flesh and blood so that he could be our merciful high priest, the one who offers up himself as the sacrifice to satisfy the wrath of God that is against us for our sins. He had to take on humanity in order to accomplish what was necessary for us to have peace with God. And praise the Lord that he's done it. But this goes beyond just his death and resurrection. Now, when we think about Jesus' atoning work, uh, it's immediately where our minds go, is to the cross. And for good reason. He died for me to pay for my sins. Hallelujah! I mean, praise the Lord. That is right and that is wonderful. But Jesus did more than just die for us. He also lived for us. Paul makes this clear in Romans 5, 18 and 19. He says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Christian, Jesus lived the perfect life of righteousness that God requires of you. He took on human flesh and came to dwell among us where He perfectly trusted and perfectly obeyed the Father in every moment of His earthly ministry. Not just when He was tempted out in the wilderness... Not just in the Garden of Gethsemane, not just as he died on the cross, every moment of his earthly life, fully trusting, fully obeying the Father. And he tells us this. Jesus says in Matthew 5, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus did in the flesh what God requires of us. And he did it through testing. He was tempted to sin, as the author of Hebrews says, in every respect as we are. And so the author of Hebrews can say that he sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. And when he talks about sympathy here, he's not talking about just like an inner feeling. Like you might feel sympathy for a friend who is going through something very hard, but that you yourself have never gone through. You feel for them, you're sad for them, but you can't quite relate because you just haven't had the same experience as them. The sympathy that Jesus has for us is one that goes to the level of experience. He can sympathize with us in our weaknesses because he has felt the weight of temptation pressing down on him just like you have. Yet, huge yet, he felt that weight and he never sinned. And that's critical. We see that in verse 15. Tempted as we are, yes, yet without sin. He cannot have succumbed to temptation, which some scholars will make that contention. Well, in order to be tempted as we are, he also had to succumb to it. Mm -mm. No, he couldn't do that and still make the many righteous. He did not sin, and the Bible is clear on that. A few quickly, Isaiah 53, 9, And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Peter, grabbing that text, applying it to Jesus, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, pointing out, not grabbing it and applying it to Jesus, like, oh, look, this is helpful, but understanding that text was talking about Jesus. 1 Peter 2.22, 2, uh, 2, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. 1 John 3.5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. When tempted in the wilderness, he wasn't hardened by disobedience and he didn't fall into unbelief like Israel did. And remember, that's the backdrop for Hebrews 3, 7 up to where we're at now. Israel didn't enter into the rest because they failed. They didn't believe and they disobeyed. 
not Jesus. He trusted and obeyed all the way to the cross. Jesus was not dominated by the serpent like Adam was either. But his perfection does not diminish his experience of temptation. He knows what it is for you to experience the weight of temptation. He is not aloof to your suffering. But now, we may read this and be like, but come on, it's Jesus. He's God in the flesh. How tempted was he really? But that's the exact thing that the author is pushing against. I want you to think about Adam before he fell. Adam was not made with corruption. But then when temptation came, that didn't make his, the temptation there any less real. The pool of sin wasn't any less strong or enticing. Christ's human nature was in no way corrupted by sin. What we've seen from Romans 5 is if, if it was... If he had taken on a corrupted human nature, then he would have been guilty by virtue of his nature, even as we are guilty before God, by virtue of our nature. You're not a sinner because you choose to sin. Well, you are a sinner because you choose to sin, but you choose to sin because you're a sinner. Your nature is corrupted, and had his been, he would have been just as guilty as we are before the Father. And he couldn't have been our high priest who atones for our sins. You have to recognize, and I think Michael has said this before, that sinfulness is a bug. It's not a feature of humanity. It was not part of God's original, very good design. So Jesus could be fully human, and he was, not have a corrupted nature, and he didn't, and still feel the pressure of temptation, just like you do. In fact, take it a step further, we need to understand that there is a sense in which he knows the weight of temptation more than we do. Think about it this way. When you are tempted by sin and you resist, what happens? The pressure continues to build. And it builds, and it builds, and it builds. And finally you break. Cave under the pressure. See, in our weakness, we never reach the point where we bear the full weight of temptation because we crack before we ever get there. You might think of it as the difference between someone who attempts to lift a heavy weight and then drops it, and the one who picks it up and slings it above their head and holds it there. See, the latter experiences the full pressure that that weight exerts. They can feel it pressing down on them. Jesus felt the full pressure of temptation. He took the full weight of temptation. He thrust it above his head, and he never yielded. He continually resisted the temptation to sin up to and through his last breath on the cross. So Christian, Jesus doesn't just feel for you. He knows the pressing weight that temptation exerts upon you. He suffered for you, and through his suffering has become sympathetic to our plight, and yet, without becoming stained by sin himself. Therefore, he is the only source, the only hope for the righteousness that we need in order to stand before a holy God. The only one who can supply the righteousness that we need in order to have peace with God, to be found pleasing in his sight. He didn't just take away our guilt. He took on our sins so that, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, in him we might become the righteousness of God. We had to have a righteousness that came from outside of ourselves. And Jesus is the only one who can supply it because he never wavered when tempted. Christian, that's your high priest. The glories of his perfections they shined like stars on a clear night sky as he endured temptations without ever failing. Therefore, he was able to lay his life down. And he was able to take his life back up again. 
and pass into the heavenly places with the offering of his own blood to make you pure before God now and forevermore. If you're not a Christian, you need to understand you cannot purify yourself. You might look at Christianity and Christians and think, it's just a crutch. Jesus is just a crutch for you guys because you're weak. I'm able, like I'm a good person, and I am able to make myself into the kind of person that God would accept if I stand before him one day. But you need to understand, and I mean this in love, you're, you're weak. Jesus is not a crutch. Do we lean on him? Absolutely we do. We'd be fools not to. Because he alone supplies the righteousness that we need. And he alone supplies the righteousness that you need. So, lean not into your own strength. Confess your sins. Turn to him and believe. I did say there was a second point, and there is. It's much quicker. Christ is our help. Amen. Christ is our help. The fact that Christ has done what you never could is meant to drive you to him. That's the emphasis of verse 16. So, five things to observe in this verse that are the direct result of Jesus' perfect endurance when tempted. And these things serve to highlight just how wonderful of a high priest our God and our King is to us, his people. First, we can draw near. The Israelites, if you remember, under the ministry of their high priests, they couldn't draw near. The high priest had to go behind the curtain into the presence of God on their behalf. They couldn't go in. They couldn't draw near to the mountain and touch it, or they would die. They couldn't go into the Holy of Holies, or they would die. And even the high priest could not afford a misstep as he went into the Holy of Holies, carrying the blood of bulls and goats on their behalf. He couldn't go whenever he wanted. He couldn't go however he wanted, or he would die. But now through Jesus, we can draw near to God. We have access to the one who loved us, who saved us, when we didn't love or desire him. We can know him, and we can interact with him at any moment of any day. Second, we see that we can draw near with confidence, because Jesus has lived for us, and has died for us, we know that his presence in the heavenly throne room ensures that we will be received. This is the reality for all who have been covered in the righteousness of Christ. See, this isn't just about escaping God's wrath on judgment day. We are now in Christ through his righteousness, acceptable to God, pleasing in his sight, because Jesus has secured that righteousness in his own righteous life. Therefore, we don't have to draw near fearfully in the sense that we might be turned away or rebuked for thinking that we could draw near to a holy God. Christ has secured our access now and forever, and we can overflow with confidence when we draw near to him. Third, we draw near with confidence to a throne of grace. It's not a throne of scorn. It's not a throne of wrath. It's not a throne of frustration. It's a place of favor, of blessing, of kindness for the people whom God has saved, who draw near to Him, helpless and needy. Christian, He is not looking down from heaven at you, scoffing at you for your weakness. He's not frowning at your groans, wondering why you don't just get your stuff together. He isn't nitpicking all your faults or rolling out a list of all the times that you have failed Him before. His throne is a throne of grace. He's gentle with His children. He's tender towards sinners. This ought to cause us to be more careful in our own interactions with weak and wounded fellow sinners. We're prone to frustration, though. How could you do that? 
Or, okay, I, we were past this. That's not to say that there's never a time for firmness. I mean, Paul is very firm in his letters to the Corinthians and to the Galatians. Jesus is firm in the letters in Revelation to some of his churches. And yet, even in this firmness, there is tenderness and there is mercy, there is grace. Why? Why is that the case for Paul in his letters? Because that's what he had received. We're called to bear with one another in a spirit of gentleness. Christ has been gentle with you, and he remains gentle towards you. Therefore, be gentle with one another. Four, there is mercy for those who draw near through Christ. And the author actually poses this as one of the reasons as to why we draw near. He says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy. We can draw near in confidence when we have sinned and know that Christ will be merciful. There is forgiveness for those who come to God through Christ, confessing and repenting of sin. Read in 1 John 1, 9. That if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is one of the fruits of Jesus' perfections and one that should be very precious to God's people, that we receive mercy. Fifth, we draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may find grace to help us in our time of need. Christian, Christ has been tempted in every way that you are, in every respect, yet without sin. He knows how to help you, and He is willing to do so. There isn't a time when you can't draw near and find that grace. Now, this is very unlike a Catholic understanding of grace. Understand under the Catholic sacramental theological system, I have to draw near in the sacraments, through the Eucharist, through confession, penance, These are the things that I have to do so that God will continue to supply me with saving grace. And just in a recent conversation with a Catholic student, me and another one of our students was told that that's the means by which we work toward salvation. Those were his exact words, work towards salvation. Grace to keep us saved. That's not what we're talking about here nor is that what we believe. He supplies the grace. We have received the saving grace once and for all in Christ Jesus through his blood-bought sacrifice for us. And we continue to receive grace that we may walk in holiness and in righteousness, having the righteousness of Christ that has been supplied to us worked out in us day after day, moment after moment, week after year, month, decade after decade. So when do we draw near? In our time of need. And being weak, our time of need is all the time. Therefore, all the time, we can draw near to the throne of grace that we may find grace to help in our time of need. It's an unending supply. So Christian, pray This is what it looks like to draw near to the throne of grace when bombarded by temptation. When temptation comes beating on the door of your heart, you cry out to God in prayer. And you can do so in confidence, knowing that you will be heard and you will receive mercy and grace. 
This is good news for us because we're living at war with the flesh and the devil. This isn't peacetime. This is wartime. To borrow another one of Michael's images, you're in the trenches. And the temptations are flying at you. These are the bullets buzzing right over the top of your head. Paul calls them fiery darts. The enemy is firing away at you day after day. Prayer is your walkie-talkie. Call HQ. There is grace there. There is help there. Our General, our Savior, gives help to His people. So call on Him in your time of need. This is what Jesus instructs His disciples to do in the face of temptation. They ask Him how to pray, and what's the last thing He tells them in Matthew 6, 13? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So our prayers when facing temptation are an expression of trust that Christ does and will give us the help we need in the moment that we need it. But still, prayer is often not our first inclination. We don't pray because we already feel defeated. I've fallen so many times before. Why is this time going to be any different? What help can he give to a sap like me? But Christian, he has been tempted in every way as you yet without sin. He has a strength that you do not possess in your flesh, and He is merciful towards you. He is gracious towards you. There is help for you to be found at the throne of grace. You can call out to Him for help and trust that it will actually be provided. Those feelings of defeat aren't godly. They're faithless. So walk in repentance by praying for Him or praying to Him for help in your time of need. Other times we put our confidence in our abilities to fend off temptation. We look to the barriers that we've put up, softwares and accountability partners, ways to distract ourselves going for a run. These aren't bad in and of themselves. Not at all. But they're secondary helps. But we like them and want to make them primary because it's something that we can do. Our weak flesh likes laws. Thou shalt call your accountability partner the immediate moment that you feel temptation. But your accountability partner hasn't been tempted in every aspect as you have been. And even if they have been tempted in the same way, they are not without sin. Christ has been tempted in every respect as us, yet without sin. So he is uniquely qualified to give you the help that you so desperately need every moment of every day as you are bombarded with desires for sin. So Christian, draw near to Christ in prayer and find help in time of need. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the mercy and for the grace that you show us through Christ, your Son. We readily confess that we are weak. We feel the pressing weight of sin, and too often we try to take that burden upon ourselves to cast it aside. Oh God, help us to see that Christ is our hope. He is the one who supplies the righteousness we need. He is the one who gives the grace we need in our moment of testing that make our efforts to resist sin effective. Turn our hearts to you and love that our affections and desires would be for you. That when we are tempted with sin, we would see it for what it truly is. That its promises are moth-eaten, they're rusted, they're producing death, and they produce mayhem in our lives. Help us to see that you are the only source of life and light and joy. And give us the grace to pursue that in Christ with all our might. Help us to live with zeal for you and your glory. Amen.